All right. Are you good? Thank you uh, to our band uh, for blessing us this morning. Let's just imp- appreciate them one more time. If you are a Christian and you are not living by faith, you are, it's like a person who has a Ferrari and they decide to walk. If you are a Christian and you do not live by faith, you are like a person who has a Ferrari and they decide to walk. Why are you walking? Why are you, why are you walking? And now you are being passed by people who are driving unos. And when you are walking, live and adjust. And the just, by faith, shall live. That's how I want, that's how I say that statement. And the just, by faith, they will live. It's faith that will enable them to live. It's faith that will push them to live. We cannot point at ourselves. We only point to God. And I said to someone, it is, a, it is a pouring season. It's a raining season. Genesis 2, 5. The Bible says, For God had not sent rain because there was no man to work the land. So God withheld the rain on purpose because there was no one to work. When man determines in his heart to work, God releases the rain. When man decides in his heart to work, God releases the rain. Says because there was no one to work, God did not release the rain. Have you decided in your heart to work? Have you decided in your mind to work? Have you decided in your mind to walk by faith? Have you decided in your mind to take steps of faith? Have you decided in your mind to move by faith? Have you decided in your mind to be tired of walking and living a small life? In 2 Corinthians, the Bible says, the smallness you feel does not come from us. It Paul says to the Corinthians, says, dear, dear Corinthians, I cannot wait for you to live a life of expansiveness. The smallness you are feeling does not come from God or from me. It comes from within you. He says, stamp out and live an expansive life. God has not given anyone a small life. God has not given anyone a small light. This little light of mine, where do you get it? Because God's light is not small. That posture, you know some of the, the, the songs we sing, they assume not a posture of humility, but a posture of smallness. We have confused the two. To a point where when someone is confident, we say they are arrogant. If you read the scripture well, Jesus sounds very arrogant. If you are a Bible reading person, Jesus is not this sweet You know, oh, so nice. Oh, so good to see you. Uh Uh-uh. He is a firm guy. He gets into the temple and and beat people up. He's a firm guy. Yeah. This is that guy who stands and says, listen, go into that city and tell them I want that, that donkey at the gate. Guys, I always make a joke and it's not a good joke. <laughs> Jesus says, go and get that, that donkey for me. And he says, when the disciples ask, when they, when they, when they ask who? He says, go tell them the Lord needs it. We have an opportunity. Whatever, God, whatever desire God puts in us, 
when we step out, when we get to where we are going, we say, the Lord needs this. I am here representing the kingdom of God. The Lord needs this. The Lord needs this building so that the people in this city can be saved. It's not us. It's not us who need it. I have my own house built. This one is the, it's his. And, and for as long as, you know, they didn't even argue with them one. When they got there and say, the Lord needs it, they gave them the donkey. You are worried about what they're going to say. Worry about what you are going to say. When you walk into the interview, the Lord needs it. I am called here. I am called to be in this space. Can I, can I preach for today? The title of my message today is Make Room for Your Miracle. If the miracle was to happen now, have you made room for it? If the greatest thing that you are trusting God was to happen now, have you made room for it? Are you ready? Have you made room for it? Because we, we talk about breakthroughs. And I'm like, yeah, 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 it's fine. You see, the chairs, this, this church, see the chairs that we just got now, they built, they built this church during COVID for 86 million rand cash. In South Africa. In Pretoria. Right here. During COVID last year, they built a church for 86 million rand. So these chairs have been sitting in a storeroom for more than a year. Because no one claimed them by faith. Because no one was willing to wait. And when we as a church made a step and say we are moving, God says, fine. Someone has woken up. We think in our prayers we are waking God up. He's just willing, I'm just waiting for someone to take a step. You see, some of us, we are boring God. God is bored. God is bored with your life. God is bored. Don't bore God, no. Give him something to do. The Bible says he does not sleep nor slumber. We have encouraged him to sleep. Because he's sitting there, it's like, psh, these people, when they come to me, they are, they don't even know what they want. They are not clear on what they want. So when we took a step of faith and say, we're ready to move, the chairs did not become available. They were always available. We were the one who were still comfortable here. Let me say that again. We were the one who were still comfortable here. It's until we get uncomfortable with our current state that the heavens stand up and say, let's work. Let's get to work. Let's get to work. Joshua. Joshua 4. And when the whole nation had finished crossing the Jordan, the Lord said to Joshua, And the Lord said to Joshua, now choose 12 men, one from each tribe. Tell them, 12 stones from every piece where the priests are standing, in the middle of the Jordan. Carry them out and pile them up at the place where you will camp tonight. So Joshua called together the 12 men he had chosen, one from each of the tribes of Israel. He told them, Go into the middle of the Jordan, in front of the ark of the Lord your God. Each of you must pick up one stone and carry it out on your shoulders. Twelve stone in all. One for each of the twelve tribes of Israel. We will use the stones to build a memorial. And in the future, 
We will use these stones to build a memorial. And in the future, your children will ask, what are these stones for? In the future, your children will ask, Audrey, will they have stones to ask questions about? The Bible says, in the future, your children will ask, what, are this, what, does, what do the stones mean? So, then you can tell them. They remind us that the Jordan River stopped flowing when the Ark of the Lord covenant went across. The stones will stand as a memorial among the people of the Israel forever. Scriptures that are missing here. It's okay. It's good. Media team, there's portions of the scripture that is missing. So don't worry about it. We're building. Don't worry about it. We're building. It's the, it's the irritations of the, it's the last kick of, the, of a dying horse. The devil is trying to frustrate us. So, one see, the people of God have crossed the Jordan River. And now that they've crossed the Jordan River, God gives them an instructions to build for him a memorial. He says, here you must build a memorial so that the next generation can know that I moved. Can I ask us a question here, especially men in this house? Do we, are we building something that our children will look at and it will symbolize the faithfulness of God in our generation? What are we busy with? Once he, when Imela grows, what will she point at and say, this is what my dad has built as a sign of the faithfulness of God? Do we have a memorabilia where the next generation can be able to identify the move of God? Or will the current move of God die with us? Because we need to do something that is tangible that the next generation can be able to come and look at and say, because of our parents' faithfulness, this is what God has done. What are we doing? Go. Oh, okay. What are we busy with? Patrick, can you help with that? There's a sound that keeps coming back to me. The last kick of a dying horse. Don't worry about it. For those that are married, have you realized that close to your wedding day, you're fighting so much? Ne? Married people, close to your wedding day, you're fighting about everything. Don't panic. It's normal. Those that are about to get married, if you're feeling a bit of tension, don't worry about it. Don't, 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 think, don't jump ship. It's normal. So the things that are happening today is a bit weird. Don't worry about it. The, the challenge is that we are busy building things that are for survival and not for legacy. When we have passed, they pass with us. It can't be that you are spending your whole life for something that will die with you. How will your children identify that God has moved in your, on your behalf? He says, when your children ask, what are these stones for? And put up, put up that picture of the stones. When they ask, what are these stones for? These are the stones. These are still there today. If you go to Israel, you are going to find these stones there today. And when the children ask, what happened here? They will say, this is when God stopped the Jordan River from flowing and we experienced the powerful move of God. In our generation, what will our children look to? What is it that we have built as a memorabilia that this shows the faithfulness of God? Let's forget about the nation. In your own home, how will your children learn about the faithfulness of God? What do you have as a symbol of the faithfulness of God? 
What can you point to and say this is the faithfulness of God that we have seen in our lives? If you are living with the consumer mentality, you have nothing to show. And you must understand that here they had, they had already crossed the Jordan River, but they still had the walls of Jericho in front of them. God says, before I even break down the walls of Jericho, build a memorabilia for me. Honor me before I move. How many of us, we want to honor God only when he has done it all? He's, you deserve me of our praise when he has done everything. God says, honor me even when the walls of Jericho are still standing in front of you for what I've already done for you. I've already moved on your behalf. Don't worry about the, the walls of Jericho. I've already moved. How many of us are missing what God has done because we are looking at what he has not done? Because he has not given me this, I'm forgetting that he has actually already done one, two, three. Make room for a miracle. I'm just passing here. Right? Now, let's if you, if you move to, and this is a portion of scripture that we know very well, in uh, Joshua 6. The story on Joshua 6, you know the story on Joshua 6, right? Bazalwan, this is like kindergarten, children's church stuff. This is where they walk around the, around the walls and the walls fall, right? How? Bazalwan, you must read your Bible also, eh? Like, like, please read your Bible. Let me just pass here before I go there. A memorial is the evidence of God's faithfulness. A memorial recognizes that God is the one who made it possible. A memorial helps others to believe in God. A memorial has eternal value. A memorial is built out of obedience, not abundance. A memorial is something that we dedicate to God to show, to thank him for his faithfulness. It's something, it's, it's, it's guys, you see with the building of this church, the move, we as a church have something to show to our children that we trusted God and God was faithful. We trusted God and God was faithful. Please, if you are tithing, using, uh, what is this? EFT. Keep those transactions. If you're tithing using cash, write down the amount. It's a memorabilia of your move. It's your memorabilia of your obedience. Record in your mind or somewhere the seasons you have served. It's stories that we will tell our children. We say, you know what, when they were building Musa Church, I was serving there every Sunday on the canal. That's how we build that church. It's a memorabilia that we can tell our children. One, see, we, you will be able to tell your children, you see that church that is there? We used to serve there and sing in the worship team. That's how we serve God. That's the sign of God's faithfulness. It's a memory that they can take with them. Our children are getting lost because we have not built them a memory of, of God's faithfulness. They have not seen God move. We have not shown them God moving. Hey, look who just, who just walked in. Okay, sorry, no, no. Back to me, back to me. Back to me, back to me. When our children grow up, we need to show them a sign that we trusted God. This is how we trusted God. I, I put it down. I have like, and maybe it's just me, I'm weird like that. At the end of the year, I, I go through, when I go through how the year went, I look at my steps of obedience. I'm like, God, thank you that I could tithe, I could serve, I could do this. I have my own diary that I write these things down so that I can, I can show Mali one day and say, hey, man, this is a story. This is my journey with God. This was my journey with God. We need to document it so that our children can know our journey with God. 
But Mr. Book, some of us are not documenting it because there's nothing to us. Am I getting personal? There's nothing to write. He says, build a monument for me. All right? Let me move. In Joshua 6, verses 1, the Bible says, Jericho was shut up tightly as the, bra- as the, as the drum because of the people of Israel. No one going in and no one going out. God spoke to Joshua. Look sharp now. I've already given you Jericho. I've already given Jericho to you. Along with the kings and the elites and and the forces. You see, what is happening here, me, is that the people build God a memorial and God brings the walls down. The people build a memorial for God and God brings down the walls for the people. God says, if you build a memorial for me, I bring down walls for you. Oftentimes we are asking for God to bring down walls for us. We jump to Joshua 6 without having passed at Joshua 4. He says, where have you built a memorial for me that shows my faithfulness? You are busy walking around the walls of Jericho, singing, hoping that they will go down. But where is your memorial? Where is your, your time of service? Where is your time of faithfulness? Where is your time of obedience? Where is your time of service to others? It says, I will take down the walls of Jericho, but you must build a memorial. There's a story in 2 Kings, in 2 Kings 4, of the Shunammite woman. You know the story of the Shunammite woman? The rich woman? What does the Bible say, Wansi? The Bible says this woman saw every time prophet Elijah would pass, she would welcome him into the house and give him food, right? And then one day he says to the husband, you know what? This prophet keeps passing here. Let us build him a room in our house. Let's build a room for God's prophet in our house. Let's build a memorial for God in our house. Let's build a room for God to dwell in our house. Let's build something. Let's build room for God in our marriage. Let's build room for God in our finances. Let's build room for God in our job. Let's build room for God. And the Bible later says, and this woman's child fell sick, and the woman the child actually died. The Bible says the child, what? Died. The father is panicking. The servants are panicking. The woman went to the child and took the child and took the child to to the upper room. He says, I have built a room for God. And when I have problems, I go back to that room that I built for God and say, God, this is a place where I build room for you. I'm not going to go through this because I built a room for you. I built room for you in my heart. I'm not going to have depression. I built room for you in my life. This is a room that I prepared for you to move mightily in my life. I have created room. When you are serving, you are creating room. When you are, when you are giving, you are creating room. Have you created room for God in your life? The space in your life that does not serve you. Hundred percent of your time serves you. Ninety percent, hundred percent of your money serves you. Hundred percent of your marriage serves you. Hundred percent of your life serves you. And then when it tumbles down, you want to invite God. The Shunammite woman created room. For the man of God. And when 
trouble came, she went back to that room and it is in that room that the child was resurrected. Have you created room for God in your life? And how do you create room for God in your marriage? Every single day you spend time with your wife in devotion to God. You spend time in the word. You spend time in scripture. You use your marriage to serve other couples. You are creating room. You create room by doing things that don't benefit you. We create room in our lives when we do things that don't benefit us, but they serve God and benefit his people. Today, you are a healthy woman and man. What are you doing with your health? How are you using your healthy body to serve the body of Christ? There's young people who want to be mentors. There's orphanages that need service. There's, there's families that need help. And then tomorrow when you are sick, you come to God, God, heal me. In what room? And that's why sometimes we have to call on God when we are sick because he is not already there. Why are you calling on him? Shouldn't he already be there? And then we make prayers. <laughs> really pray. God, if you save me from this, I'll never do it again. <laughs> God, you see, if you just, if you give me this job, I will really start tithing. I promise. Don't, God is like, don't make a promise. Make room for God. Make room for God. Your income, all of it, says you, Mr. Henry, and your needs. All of it. Your talent says you. All of it. That's not how God has designed it. We create room for God in our lives by doing things that don't hurt us. It glorifies Him and it glorifies Him. Jesus approaches Peter. Peter is on a boat. The boat is empty. And he says, can I use your boat to preach the gospel? Peter gives Jesus his boat. He says, yeah, you can have my boat to preach the gospel with it. It's empty. It has nothing. After that, Jesus then says to Peter, throw the net into the same, the same environment that was not working. Now because you have made room for me, throw the net. He says, now you have given it over to me. You have made room for me. Now you can throw the net. And now here's what happens. The beautiful thing about it. He throws the net and he catches a great catch. The boat is full. After a great catch, Jesus says to him, leave this boat and follow me. Because he understands that he is now, he is, his goal is no longer the fish, but the God who can actually bring the fish. He leaves the boat and he follows Jesus. You see, the thing is, we are easy to follow Jesus when our boat is empty. Peter followed Jesus when his boat was full. The stuff that he had been working for all his life. He says, I will leave this thing if in order to follow Jesus. I will make room for Jesus when I'm full. Guys, it's easy to make room for Jesus when you are empty. Some of us are not humble. We are broke. Yeah, no, 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 no. Listen. Don't claim yourself to be humble yet. Let's wait. Let's wait until the first million clocks. Then we will know if you are humble or not. Let's wait until God elevates you because now you have nothing to be arrogant about. I mean, come on. No one's going to take you serious. You walk in your pagile polo and you're walking like like, like, no, uh, 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 uh. I, I drive a Polo, so that's why, that's why I can talk about Polo drivers. 
You are not humble. You drive a polo. Let's wait until God blesses you with the Mercedes Benz. It's easy. It's easy to be humble and to give our life to God when they are. You know, guys, my mentor said to me, success is going to challenge you more than failure ever will. You see, guys, if you can still love God when your bank account is overflowing, um, you are, you are Busi says, God, test me. <laughs> uh, even Jabula says, Lord, test me and I will show you that I am trustworthy. But, but Matthew 16 says, if you are faithful in little, then I can trust you with much. And what is the faithfulness in little? Is creating room for God when we have little. If you cannot create room for God when, you know, so yesterday I'm driving with Mali and we go to the shop and then she sees there's two fists in the, in the car. And then she, I said to her, one is yours and one is mommy. Right? And then she takes hers and then she eats it. She finishes it and then she holds this other one. And then she's like, is this one for mommy? I'm like, that's what I said. Two minutes later, is this one for mommy? Mali, that's what I said. Is this, she kept on asking me, and that was about 5 o'clock. Her mom is coming back from work at 7 o'clock. So we have two hours to go. She is holding on to this tree. And she says, is this one for mommy? Is this one for mommy? I'm like, yeah. At one point, she has opened it. <laughs> she's, not, she's not eating it. She's like, is this one for mommy? I'm like, but you opened it. Close it. It's not yours. It's mommy's. You will ask her when we meet her. I'm like, you will ask her when you meet her. I'm training her at a young age to say, if something's not yours, you don't take it. You ask. If you're faithful with it, many of, I think, now I want to teach Mali when she's 18, when she's been doing it all. You think you have not taught yourself to tithe with your thousand rent income. You think you will tithe with a million rent. You know what tie the ad million rand give guy? Hundred tawa. You won't manage, you will die. Guys, you are a student and you are busy already. And you think when you are a manager, you will have time to serve. Hey guys, be serious. You are busy, but we can tell us which Netflix uh, show to watch. But you are busy. You can suggest to us what we must watch. And, and here's the beautiful thing that happened yesterday. When, when Mali's mom, when my wife walked the car, she dropped the suit and ran to her mom. In the presence of a mom, the suit is useless. Are we able to drop the things that we want so much in the absence of Jesus, in the presence of Jesus and say, you know what? I will leave my boat that is full to follow you. Will you drop the suit at the face when we see Jesus, when we behold him, when he says to us, go left and go right, will we be, when you have been able to build, you see, when I was saying to her, it's mommy's, it's mommy's, it's mommy's, she understands that the source of this is that lady. I need to love her more than I love the suit itself. Because she, she, she has the ability not to give me one suit to buy me hundreds of them. Many of us have fallen in love with the things that God has given us and not the God of the things. 
create room for God. Build a monument for God. And why am I preaching about this as I close? This building, this church we are moving to, is not so that we can look good. It's not so that people can say Musa Church is great. Guys, they are, the statistics are shocking of boys who give themselves to drug abuse. Right now, we don't have space to do anything about that. This house gives us an opportunity on a weekly basis to bring those boys here and mentor them. And our children ask, what is this building about? Because this is the faithfulness of God. There's girls. See, guys, Sparks is on Friday. I don't, I used to, there's a, there's a, someone please suggest another muchacho. Because the only muchachos I know is the one at Hebsu Square. And I love muchachos. I think Nando's is overrated. Muchachos is the one to go. It's even expensive. So I'm a muchachos guy. Muchachos better pay me for this. So I love going there. And then I order and then I'll sit there. And I put my phone away. They look like they are 30 years old. Getting into the kind of that probably their dad is not even dreaming about. Only God knows where they are going. It's because we have not created an alternative for them. We have not created an alternative for them. We can't blame the world when we are the ones with the authority. We can't blame the war when we are the ones with the mandate. So this building gives us an opportunity every Friday night to bring around young people from the University of Pretoria and say to them, man, there's purpose in your life. We're building a memorial of the faithfulness of God. It has nothing to do with us, but the restoration of God's city. It has absolutely nothing to do with us. I, Ishmael, plays the bass. There's a guy here. So Ishmael is probably the hottest bassist in the country, if you didn't know. Right? Right now. Like, he is the guy. He's the it guy. You know, in music, there's it people. He's the guy who, who gigs with the, with the big musicians. And every Sunday he comes here and he plays space for a hundred of us. Creating room for God in his gifting. Even as God has elevated him so high. Then Ishmael comes to me and say, Hey man, have you realized that in this church, you have at least five worship leaders. Other churches don't even have one. And not just worship leaders, professional musicians. So it's not once more in them don't, don't sing like us in the shower. They sing for a living. And I want to show you something. So we have one small, he's a professional musician. We have Bongi and Colin, they're professional musicians. We have, we have Ossie, he's a professional musician. We have, we have, we have Dudu, Dudu is a, is a professional, we have, we have, is a professional musician. We have, we have Taki, she's a professional musician. We have Ishmael, we have Togozani Zano at the back there, he's a, he's a professional musician. We have CJ. We have, we have Kara Kimuriti. He's a professional musician. This are, pe- this are this, just here. These are people that churches want to pay big money so that they can go to their churches. Ishmael then comes to me and says, why? 
why would we have all these musicians in one church? For what reason? When so many other churches don't have musicians, why would we have all these musicians coming here? And then Ish says, let's open a school of ministry. He says, let's open a school of worship where we can empower other worship teams. Because these people did not come here from Muso Church. They are coming through Muso Church, not to Muso Church. God has brought them together to empower churches in the city. This building allows us to have week, uh, every month we can have a whole Saturday where we sit with worship teams and help them to improve in their worship. Without asking for money for anything, we are building a memorabilia of the faithfulness of God. Churches will say, you know what? God through that church, he has helped us to develop. In five years' time, I, the, the success cannot just be standing there and there's 20,000 people in front of me. If that's all, ah, guys, let, 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 let's go to a concert. Kesper and your best concert. We want to be able to look at schools and say, we have touched this school, this school, this school. We want to be able to look at kids and say, we have touched this one, this one, this one, this one. We have to be able to look at churches and say, we have built the worship team from this church to this church to that church to that church. We don't want to be the talk of the town. We want churches that are talk of the town. Regardless of how big we are going to be, we can never reach the whole city by ourselves. And we are here to ensure that in, listen guys, in five years, if the, the only church everyone is speaking about is Musa Church, then we failed in our mandate. Every church that is in our vicinity, we need to say, how do we make it better? Me and my wife, we said this week, so we're moving to, to this building, and so we using the other, so from the door to the side. That's our section of, so maybe you think we're getting the whole building. No. That's our section of the building, right? And then on this corner here, there's a, there's a small church that, that is there. Right now, they're having church there, Right? And me and my, church, me and my wife were like, so we went there on Sunday and we didn't even know there was a church because there was no branding, there was nothing. And we're like, my goodness, look at the banners, the amount of banners we have. We're going to bury them in, in branding. And we decided we're going to, as part of our budget, we're going to do branding for them. So, so that as a person drives through the gate, they don't come to us by mistake. They know that where their church is. So we're going to print our banners for them as a token just to say, hey man, thank you for the work that you've been doing in this community and we are here to serve with you. We're not going to serve with you. We're not going to serve with you. Because there must be a better reason to doing it than just looking good ourselves. There must be a better reason than to just do it ourselves. So we, we're going to meet with them and say, guys, we want to, for every banner that is Musa Church, we want to put your banner there. So that your people can know where their church is. If they come to us, then there's nothing we can do about it. We've done our best. We have done our best. What else can we do? And that's what I'm saying, guys. We are called to live beyond ourselves. That's how once the small boy had five loaves and two fish for himself. It was his food. He gave it away with no guarantee of getting anything back. We are just responding to a need that God has. Creating room. And God used the five loaves from this boy to multiply and feed the 5,000. And at the end of that, 
the top basket. Yes. The potential of what is in our hands to multiply is when we create room for God in it. It's when we create room for God in it. The boy created room for God. Peter created room for God. Shunammite woman created room for God. Joshua said to the people, let us build a monument for God and he will take down the walls for us. Many of us, our walls are not falling down because we have not built a monument for God. We have not created room for God. If there's an area in your life that you feel there's a wall, track back and see how much of God has room in that space. Don't worry about your prayer life and all this stuff. No, no, no. Just go and check. How much of this is actually surrendered to God? How much of this job is actually surrendered to God? Or has this job become God? How much of this marriage is actually surrendered to God? How much of this business is actually surrendered to God? Or has it become God? And you realize every area in our lives where we create room for God, He breaks down the wall. May, may you be inspired to create room. It's a simple thing. It sounds very simplistic. Create room for God. So, 